Good evening, Ani Buju, everyone. Welcome to the 65th episode of Red Hoop Talk, the Native News and Talk Show produced by the Association on American Indian Affairs. I'm Colleen Medicine. I'm the program director with the association, and I'm coming to you from northern Michigan, the heart of the Great Lakes State. And um, I'll turn over to Jamie and let her introduce herself. Ihani Washte. Jamie Amachiapie. Uh, I am Jamie and I am in uh, the great state of Montana right now. <laughs> uh, and I am the virtual office manager here at the association. Well, we have a really exciting um, episode for you this evening. A very good friend of mine is joining us. Um, we couldn't figure out how to leave him backstage. Uh, so he just joined us um, on screen. Um, my good friend, Zach Khalil. And you'll notice that uh, Shannon O'Loughlin, the chief executive and attorney with the association who you normally see on Red Hoop Talk, is not with us this evening. She's um, enjoying herself on a well-deserved vacation this evening. So Jamie and I are stepping in. Um, so please forgive us in advance for any uh, technical difficulties that may occur this evening. Shannon, if you're watching, we hope that you're enjoying your pizza and crumb cake, I think it was. Uh, so we, we're, we're going to do our best to be right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we hope, we hope she's proud and, and enjoying herself. So let's, let's get into it. Red Hoop Talk, Friday evening. Um, Zach's with us. Oh, Zach, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone? Ani Bojo, Ms. Kwani Bini, Indigenous Cause, Bauteng and Donjaba. Uh, my name is Zach Khalil. Uh, I'm a filmmaker and artist, um, originally from Bauteng or Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Um, currently based in New York and, and moving around a bit. Um, and yeah, my, my practice is really, um, you know, rooted in, in filmmaking, kind of first and foremost, um, and kind of uh, installation and in fine arts, um, but always sort of thinking about how um, we can really think about like what uh, what film or cinematic form is from an indigenous perspective, and you know for me specifically an Anishinaabe perspective, um, trying to kind of reimagine what movies can be in a way. Yeah. Wow! So you're out and you're out in Brooklyn, New York. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. I've been based in Brooklyn for the past ooh, like five or six years now. Um, it's it's intense and hectic, um, but it's a, a good place to, to make work and, and get it seen, which is cool. But um, yeah, I always like to go back home, back to the Sioux, back to Bawatang, whenever I can. It keeps me grounded. I think otherwise I, I, couldn't, I couldn't live in Brooklyn forever, for sure. Yeah, that, that really makes sense to me because when I think about filmmaking and like, you know, cinema, it feels like New York City is like the place to be. <laughs> is that accurate? Totally, yeah, yeah, in a lot of different ways. Yeah, there's, you know, they shoot a lot of films here. Um, but, you know, what I really like is there's just like a great uh, community and network of, of filmmakers um, that is so positive and supportive. Um, classic New York sign in the background, so apologies for that. <laughs> um, but I think the other really cool thing about New York too that uh, I think people forget sometimes is that like New York is, has, is the city with like the largest population of Native Americans in the country. And like part of that is because it's, it's one of the largest cities of course, um, but there is like a really serious Native presence here that is uh, really amazing to like be part of and, and be part of that, that community there. Um, and then when you get deeper down, there's like, yeah, like a community of Native artists too, and Native filmmakers um, that is really awesome just to be around people from, from different tribes, you know, doing similar work. Um, yeah, as like alienating as, the, as this place can be sometimes, it's like that sense of, of community that really makes it worth it, you know? Wow. So... So, so you're saying there's like a, a big community of maybe like native artists there. And um, I'm wondering, like, when you said maybe you collaborate, what, what kind of projects do you all collaborate on? Yeah, uh, I, I kind of a lot of different projects. Um, I think 
I mean, first and foremost, I should share that uh, I work really closely collaboratively with my brother, um, Adam Khalil, uh, who unfortunately can't be here today. But, um, but like my practice and our practice together is like always really inherently collaborative uh, from the start, first and foremost. Um, and so me and him collaborate a lot on, on films, um, you know, documentary films, uh, narrative films. I think when I try to think about uh, filmmaking uh, sort of collaboratively and with my brother, uh, I really try to think about like um, the history of, of film and cinema in relationship to, to native peoples, um, especially because um, I feel like like native people have always been in the center of, of the camera, um, but have so rarely been able to be like behind it, you know? Um, and so much of like uh, how films normally operate um, are, is really kind of from, from a settler perspective in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of our work tries to like, um, we try to do the research to like be, learn about the sort of history of film in that way, uh, to use it as like a launching off point for, for trying to accomplish something else with it. Um, and yeah, there's a, a lot of different specific um, projects. I think it might be helpful to talk about um, the first film, feature film I've ever made with my brother. Um, I was going to ask before we jumped into your filmography, just to interrupt, I wanted to know how you and Colleen met each other. Um, Cause I know you guys are friends and that's how you came on the show with us. So how did the two of you meet? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that, um, so, so Adam, uh, Zach's brother is a year older than me. And then Zach is a year younger than me. And so we were all kind of um, intertwined through our, our youth program um, from our tribe. So we met at youth activities and became friends and we um, established kind of this lifelong friendship and um, through all the things, right? So, so, so Zach and Adam, they went off to New York City and went to school there. And I, I went to a different school downstate in Michigan and we kind of lost touch for, for many years, just almost just like silently, like rooting for each other on social media, but never really talking. And um, I think maybe it was almost like maybe 2011, 2012, we kind of um, ended up meeting up in the same place and same time and like kind of rekindled our amazing friendship. And then we've just carried it through now for almost what feels like 10 years of like um, being best friends. So um, these guys uh, do such incredible work in filmmaking and really, um, are, you know, our communities here are so proud of, of what they do. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think that's how we met. What do you think, Zach? That, that, that totally sounds right. It's, I was going to say, I was like <laughs> trying to think of the exact time and I'm like, we've known each other for so long and it's, it's hard to know because we just like grew up in that way. Um, but yeah. That's, that's when you have friendships that you can like jump back into, even though you haven't talked for a long time. I'd Definitely. say about 20 years, 20 years or more, maybe even. Totally. A friendship. Totally. So, so yeah. Um, and, and I was making fun of Zach earlier, slightly, just a little baby make fun of him because um, I was laughing that he must have all of his resources with his camera equipment that he uses to, to film make. And so he's joining us tonight from, from his cell phone. Uh, so <laughs> uh, you'll have to excuse his audio. We'll ask you to speak up a little bit. Uh, Zach, he, he's, he's directed all of his attention and resources to his, his equipment for work and not his personal uh, devices, so. <laughs> totally busted. I'll be sure to speak up. Yeah, I, I busted you, but it, I just want to uh, make a, I, I had to make a joke, you know, we had to break the ice. It's our, our first time doing Red Hoop Talk without Shannon here. So I was a little nerved up, but it feels like it's going well and, and uh, I had to make a little joke. So uh, if you're watching right now, make sure you let us know where you're from. I know Shannon always does that. And again, welcome. Uh, but let's drop where you're at below so we can just kind of say hello and uh see who all is here too so okay uh without further ado zach tell us about your filmmaking <laughs> now that we got that out of the way uh. um yeah i think 
I think a, a good place to start um, also kind of has to do with me and Colleen's relationship to a certain extent, um, which is that like, I don't think I would have ever become a filmmaker um, if it wasn't for my mother, uh, Alison Krebs, who uh, Colleen also knew, knew really well too. Um, and she um, did a lot of things throughout life. Uh, she worked for youth education activities for the tribe for a long time. Um, and when, when my brother went to college, um, she decided that she wanted to go back to school as well. And she went to get um, her master's and eventually PhD in um, like information sciences, um, sort of focusing on an indigenous perspective, um, thinking about ways of making sure that tribes have uh, our own ability to, to uh, archive our own history in our own ways. Um, and so her work has always been really inspirational to me. Um, and she uh, pursued it really intensely. Um, and she always kind of wanted to be a filmmaker too and make videos uh, as kind of about that subject matter. Um, and she started to uh, a decent amount. Um, and unfortunately she passed away while pursuing uh, that PhD in information sciences and kind of working on a film about it. Um, and that was like, a super devastating time in my life. But uh, my mother also just like gave me so much um, knowledge um, and her passing was a real uh, motivator in the end um, for me to try to continue her work um, and with the skills that I had, um, which was at that point like sound and, and film as well. Um, so, I never really considered being a filmmaker until that had happened uh, or never, never really felt like it was possible even in the first place. Um, and I think there was something about wanting to make her proud and like continue her legacy that gave me the courage to try to make movies. Cause, cause making movies is like, it's really fun, but it's like really hard <laughs> too sometimes uh, and can be really discouraging. Um, so I think that, gave me the motivation to like to, uh, to try to continue her work in that way. Um, and I think the sort of result of that is uh, me and my brother's first film, uh, Not To Say, um, which is a, a word in, in Anishinaabe Moan um, that I think translates really, um, the basic crude translation is it just means like movie essentially. Um, but there is also like uh, a syllabic translation that, that sort of breaks down the word even further. And that translation is inate is it shines a certain way to a certain place and say is it flies or it falls. Uh, and that title or that name like had a few different meanings uh, for me. I feel like the, that word breakdown itself is cool because it, it really, um, it shows you how powerful the language is and that it, what it really does is it explains like the mechanism of, of film projection, sort of. Um, it shines a certain way to a certain place. It's like the, the projector, it shines onto, onto the screen. Um, and then it flies or it falls was about like uh, the film reel falling in front of the projector. I just thought that was really um, poetic and beautiful. And anytime I like learn more about the etymology of, of Anishinaabe words, I'm always sort of blown away by the, the depth that's contained in something that could be just a movie. Um, and so that was like one meaning of that title for me and my brother, but I think another meaning was kind of closer and more personal, um, which is like, it shines a certain way uh, to a certain place. And for us, that was like where we were raised in Balatin, um, in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, and it flies, it falls. Uh, kind of like referred to the the production of the film and how it had to be something kind of spontaneous uh, and something that that not so much that we determined, but something that we kind of had to follow in a way. Um, and that's something that I think a lot about with filmmaking from an indigenous perspective or an Anishinaabe perspective is like thinking about the ways that even like engaging in, in the process of, of making a film uh, can be like uh, a spiritual experience and not in a traditional way, but maybe in a contemporary way can like be a form of ceremony or, or community making. Um, Cause it, it really involves like, 
you know, a lot of interaction with people and a lot of uh, really deep discussion and, and learning and, and opening oneself up to sort of talk about something really, really huge that, uh, and, yeah. And so that film, that, that process of making that film, I guess I should explain, maybe actually before I explain it, why don't you cue up the trailer and then I'll yeah. talk about it. How does that sound? Well, let's take a look well, at I it. I have lots of questions now after having that discussion <laughs> about your perspective. So let's show the yeah. trailer. Yeah, let, let's, show, let's show the trailer. I think it, it'll give a little more um, insight into the kind of flair and like the, the way that, that this film came out and you can really, well, let's wait. Let's. It is from understanding that power comes. And the power in the ceremony was in understanding what it meant. I saw more than I can tell, and I understood more than I saw. I did not have to remember these things. They remembered themselves all these years. Wow. You know, one thing I always thought about and not to say is like how I, when I used to describe it to other people, right? Uh, I used to say like, it's provocative. Like it's got this, like this, this way about it that makes you feel a little uncomfortable because of the issues that are going on in it and the way that, you know, the film presents those things, which I don't know the technical terminology for, but um, I just wanted to say that I think when you watch the trailer, even you feel it like it's going to it's going to bring up some some shit. <laughs> the, totally. I think that, that's that's super true. Uh, yeah, yeah, just just to maybe give a little more background on the film, because the trailer doesn't really say what it's about. It's just kind of a teaser more than anything else, um, which is to show some images from it. Um, but I guess uh, the what the film really was from that, from the beginning, um, was thinking about, first of all, kind of like I was talking about, thinking about how to develop, like, uh, you know how different countries have like different um, styles of filmmaking? You can think of like French cinema or Japanese cinema or American cinema. And I was like trying to think about like what an Anishinaabe form of cinema could be like. Um, and, and I think some of the, the principles that like, trying to kind of led the creation of the film was, was thinking about that. And a few of those things were sort of like thinking about more of like a, a cyclical relationship to time. Um, and also like a, a production process, like of making the film that's uh, more open-ended and about like allowing everybody who's in the film to sort of dictate what it's about, as opposed to telling everybody what it needs to be about and what kind of sound bite you want from them. Um, so that was like part, part of the interest was like thinking formally about how to make an Anishinaabe kind of film. And then in terms of like the actual content, um, uh, the basis of the film is essentially like a, a retelling or a reimagining of the Seven Fires prophecy, um, the sort of uh, Eddie Benet -Ben version from the Mishomas book. Um, and thinking about the Seven Fires prophecy in Sault Ste. Marie and Bawatin really specifically, um, and thinking about how each step along of the prophecy is sort of like, is still felt in contemporary life in Sault Ste. Marie, um, where, we, where we both grew up, and, and creating a film that was both like historical in that sense, and, and tell, tells that story of, of colonization and cultural revitalization, um, but in a way that, that isn't just focused on, on the past, but the way that the past and the present and the future all, all influence each other in, in a cyclical way. 
Um, and I think we're really fortunate to have the, this like amazing storytelling tradition and this amazing story. Um, and it really served as like the, the backbone for the film um, and sort of provided a, a structure that was built in in the prophecy itself, which I think really enabled us to um, make the film in a much more collaborative way with, with everybody that, that was in it. I think one thing that's kind of cool now, um, it's really awesome to be interviewed by Colleen because I've interviewed Colleen so many times um, for this film and, and a few other films. Um, she's in it not to say as well. Um, so that dynamic is, is really amazing. Always a great, great interviewee. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, in like documentary film production specifically, there's always this idea that you kind of like, the interview should be as short as possible to save time and, and hard drive space. And you should really be going in to like get a sound bite from somebody. Um, and what we really wanted to do was not to say it was like, know that we had that Seven Fires Prophecy story as a structure and to, to talk to people we knew, uh, you know, community members um, about the Seven Fires Prophecy and see what they wanted to tell us about it and, and the way they think about it in relationship to their own lives. Um, so it was like a much more open-ended production process where it was really about like, just sitting down with people and visiting. Uh, and we did maybe like 40 interviews and they would range from like one and a half to like three, three or four hours, you know, if you're, if you're visiting with someone. It's, just, it's like a wide ranging conversation. Um, I think that's like what the film's, you know, content is about on paper. I think there's sort of like a, a conceptual thrust behind it that's kind of more related to um, my mother's work, like I was talking about, the sort of information library sciences, thinking about uh, how history is archived, who's telling history, how do they tell it, um, and how that changes, depending on sort of which side you're on, in a way. Um, so a big part of the film, too, is for me, is um, think contrasting these sort of uh, Anishinaabe ways of of knowing history and passing history on and recording history, including like Birch Bark Scrolls or the Seven Fires Prophecy itself and the sort of oral storytelling tradition, um, and contrasting that with the way that settler institutions have tried to sort of encapsulate and tell our history. Um, there's a scene in the film of um, an archive, uh, it's actually the the archive at the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, and sort of like, which is an amazing institution. Um, but the, you know, it's ultimately a, the US government's stuff, you know, uh, which is, is kind of a hard pill to swallow sometimes. I mean, like, that's one way our history is told. And then another sort of more settler institution uh, that's sort of showcased in the film is the Tower of History. Um, which is like a location in Sault Ste. Marie that uh, I think is kind of, it's like a, a touristy spot now. Um, it's a, this huge tower. I think it's like 300 feet tall or something insane like that. There was originally supposed to be um, the bell tower for like a, a Catholic mega church. Um, but I guess in the 60s, the economy took a dive in Sault Ste. Marie. And I think also they built the tower so large that they had to drill down like 80 feet into the ground and they just ran out of money basically. So it's just this like really huge concrete, like brutalist architecture tower. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's literally one room basically, or two rooms. There's one room at the bottom, 300 feet of concrete and one room at the top. Um, and the church donated it to the city on the precondition that it remain a museum and, or shrine to the missionaries um, that, that colonized Sault Ste. Marie. Um, and that institution was like a place, you know, growing up and going to public schools where like we had to go on field trips to the Tower of History um, and yeah. sort of have our own history or a, a version of our own history explained to us um, in a way that I think was actually really, you know, messed up and kind of destructive. Um, this sort of like whitewashed version of the history of Sault Ste. Marie. Um, 
Colleen, when we when I come there to visit you, you're gonna have to take me to go see that then, so that you can walk me through it. I was gonna try to pull up. I didn't know we were gonna talk about the Tower of History. I always pulled up a picture, but I, I'm like, I'm silently over here agreeing and chuckling because it's <laughs> like, it's like this ginormous like, like, colonizer statue in the middle of, of you know the second oldest city in the country. And in, in one of you know one of the oldest places at the Anishinaabek you know resided. So it, it's like there's just so much to it, you know. And, and putting it into the, the film the way that you did, um, there's there's some really good footage there. Of just trying to show the story of like who who can tell the history better, right? Who's the expert of our own, of our own history? I'm, now, I like to say that, you know, like Native people, we know our own history. We, we, we know that <laughs> when and because it's not written in books and it doesn't have, you know, um, citations and, and all these things, you know, we can, you know, people assume we couldn't possibly know our own history. And so they try to tell it for us. Uh, but but and the film really brings that to life like that. Um, that push and pull between, you know, two worlds and, and like, whose, whose story is this? So I honestly wish that we could show a little bit more of a not to say, but um, I, I, alas, I don't have the, the link handy, but. Well, it, it makes me ask, I just keep thinking like a kind of a twofold question. And so like on one side I'm wondering, like when you're approaching filmmaking, knowing that like, our cultures across, you know, what is known as the United States today, it, we're, it's oral history. And so the filmmaker, when you're documenting things like our stories and things like that, how do you kind of weigh out the balance between recognizing that it's oral history and having respect for ancestors and elders that, you know, and communities, but also making sure that folks that live on the land, you know, acknowledge the history that's happening. We're telling that, like, how do you find that balance between those two things? Because I know it's controversial. Anytime you do anything in Indian country and you're sharing anything that is like history, some people lean on the side that like, they didn't do that. It's it's ours. But then other folks are like, everyone needs to know because they live here. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good question. That's a that's a really great question. Yeah, it's it's a really tricky dynamic, and I I agree with with both sides. I think a lot. You know, there's this um, that's sort of one of my fears about making that film in the first place. Is like making a film about my own community, but you know. That film for me, first and foremost, is like for for people in Vawateng, for Anishinaabek people, for indigenous people in general, and then for everybody else. Um, but the reality is, it gets seen it gets seen by everybody, right? And or hopefully that's that's the goal sometimes. Um, but yeah, there's this uh, this history of film being such an extractive. Uh, process, especially in relationship to our communities, where it's something where, where people kind of parachute in, get capture whatever they want, and and leave and share it with everybody else um, in a way that like can't be controlled or you know that isn't that that person to person relationship, which I think is so important. Um, yeah, and there's just this sort of history. I I think too, it's like. It's a it's a tough situation with with settlers where it's like it's so hard to share with settlers because every time we do it gets taken away and exploited or twisted into something else or sold you know um, so it is really nerve wracking to 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 do something like that and know that that, that it's out of your control sort of after that point um, mm. and so we just really tried to keep that in mind the, the entire time. And because at the same time, while there is that risk of, of it being extracted or exploited, I think also if we don't tell our stories to settlers and other people, that it's not, it's not good for the, us and the tribes in, in the long run, because for better or for worse, we're, we're living alongside each other. Um, and and the Tower of History is telling our story. Um, so if if we don't in some ways, it's, 
these misconceptions and stereotypes just continue forever. Um, but I totally agree too that, that you can definitely give away too much. Um, and that was something we thought really hard and long about and something that we tr try to talk to everybody about in the, in the interviews um, as well. And, you know, it's a really fine line. Um, I think like one hard rule is like, we don't show anything ceremonial in, in any way whatsoever. Um, so it's like drawing those kind of obvious hard lines. Um, I think one thing that was really helpful for me thinking through that during the filmmaking process was an interview we did with um, Harlan Downwind, uh, who's uh, an amazing traditional healer who worked at our tribe for, for a long time. So unfortunately he's passed away. Um, but he was incredibly inspirational for me in the process of making this film and, and the interview and the conversations that we had. And I feel like one of the things he said to like paraphrase um, was that like, that secrecy and the sort of hesitancy to share, um, you know, has its place definitely and, and is important because of that extractive potential. But that, it, that if we don't share some things, um, if it's just only habitual secrecy, then that, that's not that's not good for us in in the long run. And that he was sort of saying that like now is the time to share some of this, um, but you know, in a thoughtful way where you're really uh, not giving it all away and just being really intentional about what is shared. And it's more of these like personal conversations um, and this sort of broader story. But I think the other thing is that uh, when you talk about an oral, an oral history or oral traditions, there's no definitive version in, in a great way of all of these stories. So that can be tricky as well. Like whose story are you telling and is it the, the right one? Um, I think one thing we try to do is like never indicate that we're telling a definitive version. Uh, and not to say for me, it's very much like me and my brother's perspective of the seven fires prophecy based in Bawa Ting, you know, and it's not the seven fires prophecy. Um, it's like really about our, our subjective experience and in our community. Um, because there's so many different versions of the seven fires prophecy. Um, the version Harlan told me is that the the seventh fire is uh, total spirituality, um, like which I think is death to a certain extent, which is a totally different um, reading from the Eddie Ben Benet one, maybe, and that's arguable. But uh, but just as it goes to, there's a lot of different iterations, and I think a way to avoid um, overstepping is is to not be really clear about not being definitive and about being about a subjective experience more than anything else. This is, um, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate this conversation because it can get really dicey, right? And, and, and whose story are you telling or whose version of this or who did you ask for that and who was involved? And um, I, so I can really appreciate it. It feels a lot like just like decolonizing the process and I, and I like what you just said, like, if we don't, if we leave it open-ended, if we don't give a definitive ending, then it's just open for interpretation. And I love that. That feels a lot to me like what I imagine Anishinaabe filmmaking would be like, because we are storytellers, you know, we come from, we come from a long line of people who are storytellers. And um, the Ojibwe, we're also like keepers of, of tradition. And so, in a, in a lot of ways, it feels like what you did here and what you continue to do with your films is like documenting things in a good way, um, but but doing it in a respectful way. And, and you mentioned like you did all you know, 40 interviews. I mean, I imagine a lot of those included a lot of knowledge keepers and practitioners and elders and, and people who kind of guided this process. And so the product, not only is it informed by your connection, you and Adam, having this like really great wonderful like brotherly connection the connection with your mom the connection with the land where you come from but also the connection to the community and it really shows in, in the film so i know we're doing all this talking about it but where can people see it <laughs> and why don't you share a little bit about how successful this film is? <laughs> it's it's gotten out there for sure <laughs> into the world um 
yeah, we've been really fortunate uh, to be able to screen the film in, in a lot of different contexts. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, we screened it just in Sault Ste. Marie to everybody in the film before anything else. And that's another important thing that uh, isn't part of a Jacques Ganache filmmaking tradition, you know, um, that was really important for us to do uh, in like a documentary. Yeah. In documentary in general, you're never supposed to give your subjects, which I think is also a weird term and way, like the ability to have final cut over the film. But I think as like a collaborative community-based process that felt really wrong to us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. The film had its premiere after that at uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which was a shock to us, to be, to be honest, um, but was really exciting and served as like, uh, a launching pad and a, an amazing confirmation for us. And then we did uh, sort of a reservation tour after that, um, kind of throughout the Midwest and Minnesota and Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and have since, yeah, showed it in universities and, and film festivals. Um, but it's currently finally um, online uh, as well. And I will, maybe I can post a link in the chat. That might be an easy way of doing it. Yeah, I, I think our viewers would want to see it. I I encourage everyone who's watching this or will watch this in the future to take a look at this film. It's it's pretty amazing. Um, so uh, I oh go ahead. I wanted to circle back. Um, exactly. on Tell me that. when you're done. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna change the subject and have like more film making unrelated questions uh, to our topic. So you wrap up and then I'll. Um, actually, I was hoping that we could talk about the next film. So if you have an unrelated film question, you might want to interject it now because we're going to talk about the next film. Well, I was just going to ask, there's so many great documentaries out there and just even there's starting to be more and more films and obviously, you know, there's more TV being made, Reservoir Dogs, or um, Reservation Dogs is coming out. We had Rutherford Falls come out. And so like, what are some of your favorites that you can recommend to people that you think they have to like absolutely go out and watch um, either to add to the reservation or just because it's entertaining? <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, Reservation Dogs I'm really looking forward to. No one's seen it yet, but no. Sterling's good enough that I think we can all put it on the list, put it on the list to go and check out. Mm -hmm. um, Rutherford Falls is amazing. And I don't know, just shocking to me, just to like see that much amazing <laughs> representation. I don't know. I've had like emotional experiences watching it. Just like, oh my God, this is on TV. <laughs> like, um, and you know, it has its, yeah, but that's pretty amazing in and of itself. Um, Jeff Barnaby, uh, I think he's a Micmac filmmaker, who made um, a film, Rhyme, Rhymes for Young Ghouls, um, that I think might be on Netflix, that actually got a Canadian filmmaker that got really good distribution, and it's pretty, a uh, pretty amazing film. Um, I think Sky Hopinka um, is a, a, a filmmaker, indigenous filmmaker, um, who makes a lot of short films, um, kind of like in a more uh, experimental or artistic vein, kind of quasi-documentary. Um, and he recently came out with a, a feature film that's really amazing that I would definitely recommend as well. Um, there's so many, actually. I feel like there's a real um, sort of renaissance, uh, or not renaissance, just a sort of explosion um, of, of Native film these days. And it's really actually rising to the top and all being seen. Um, Fox Maxi is a, is a really amazing, amazing indigenous filmmaker. Uh, there is a cut hand. I feel like I just, I want to just I could list them all out. <laughs> There's so many these days. It's like pretty shocking. And LMI Tail Feather, the body remembers when the world broke open. That one's on Netflix. Um, and it's really, it's, I'm so glad you asked because I remember being in college and like being interested in, in film and asking one of my professors, like, hey, can you recommend some like native filmmakers or some experimental native filmmakers? Um, and this professor is great and like had a PhD from Yale and was like a huge brain. Um, but his answer was basically like, 
no, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. Um, and that was maybe like 10 years ago now. And it's not to say that there weren't then. Clearly, like he just didn't know, and that's his, that's his problem. But um, I think also there just wasn't that much like so easily available and seen. And now it's like, it's not like there's like a token thing here and there. There's really like a whole landscape of, of native media, um, ranging from like really serious docs to crazy narrative films to comedies. It's like, yeah, it's a really exciting time to finally see that happen. Do you all have some favorites? I, I don't know that I keep up on like names or anything, but I, I will say that um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed Rutherford Falls uh, specifically. like And I liked it. I loved the whole thing, right? But I love that there was, there was um, a part that, uh, spoke about NAGPRA because of obviously NAGPRA is so dear to my heart. I've been doing that work for so long. Um, so I, I really love that aspect. I loved um, that we were talking about real life issues in the show. Like it was so relatable, right? Like I've been to those places. I've done those things. I've worn that t-shirt. I've had that cool bead work and you know, all the things that were represented. It was like, it finally felt like something was ours in a place that it's never ours. Like, you know, before we never even had a, a place at that table. So I think it felt, um, you know, really cool to watch Rutherford Falls, but I will admit that's my kind of um, real, real like um, uneducated opinion because I don't know much else. <laughs> There's Jamie. Uh -oh. um, yeah. I thought the other thing I really loved about that show is that it really felt like it was for Native people and not just trying to explain Native people to a white audience, which is pretty rare, I find, too. Yeah, and I think also one thing that, I, I mean, I've heard a lot of talk about, like, how it, it accurately represents, you know, Native communities, but one thing that was real dear to my heart is that we have, like, a main character who was, like, defined, you know, you know the the body norms and and, and you know um, you know representing um, a whole part of, of society that doesn't get represented normally on film. So um, that was really really important to me to like see a woman who I felt so like close to. I could relate to her as the main character in a show. Um, I felt like that was really really great for me. Totally. What about you? Anything else? You know, they use, I mean, this is not an advertisement for Rutherford Falls, trust me, but you know that they use like all indigenous artwork and like, like the jewelry was all made by indigenous artists and the shirts they wore. So like a lot of the things you see on the walls in the background that was like all done by, by art, right? Like artists, you know, that, that contemporary artists. So that was really cool. Um, one thing that I'm kind of wondering, and I'm going to kind of segue into a different direction, like you being out there in Brooklyn and, and being in a big city like that, kind of far from home, like how do you, how do you, you know, ground yourself in, in spirituality? How do you really, you know, stay, how do you stay close to your culture? How do you, how do you do that in a place that feels like it's a lot of pavement and moving really fast pace and, kind of uh, like the hustle and bustle of the big city. Totally, that's a, a great question. And yeah, I'd be lying if I didn't say that it's not challenging to do that here, uh, way more so than it would be at, at home. Um, I think one of the really basic things for me is just like maintaining a practice of, of praying with tobacco on a, on a regular basis um, and just really checking in um, and you know, at home, it's nice to be able to do that in a beautiful place. And in New York, it's sometimes really strange and surreal that doing that on a sidewalk or you can't always find a beautiful place to do it, you know? Right. Um, and just being okay with that and realizing that that's not, that it's it's the communication that matters and the checking in and not the scenery, I guess, as silly as that sounds. Um, yeah, I think, and I think, to be honest, another big thing is just like, uh, leave it, 
<laughs> as, as much as possible <laughs> and going home. I, I think it's between like, yeah, that personal practice, going home as often as possible and like really working to forge community with other native people here. So it's like, yeah, so it's something like that, that can be lived in community, right? And not just uh, sort of isolated. Um, sure. But it's definitely a challenge for sure. Yeah, one time I I was talking to uh, a former or someone a former a tribal member who was formerly incarcerated, and he was talking about his prayer from from inside an institution, and he said something similar like that, like, you know, your your prayer is about your intention, right? And like, you know, being able to pray no matter where you're at. So, I think that's that's something we all need to hear because so many of our people live in you know big cities, right, and in urban areas. Totally. I, I think too, the, in, in a way my filmmaking practice tries to, to keep me tied to, to my culture and community as well. And it's like in really obvious ways where I'll go home and record a lot and bring it back and be watching it for months. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a reason I'm doing that. That's subconscious, obviously too, you know? And it's like, and why, yeah, why being gone, why I've, I need to record it so that way I can check it out later and like ground myself in that way too. So what, um, so, so there's, so speaking of films grounding you and kind of leading you down a certain path, um, isn't it uh, true that you were kind of, you guys were, you and your brother Adam were kind of led into a direction to focus like a little bit on some repatriation stuff yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, and and to be transparent, um, it was it was your work with repatriation that I found particularly inspiring, um, and that really was like an education for myself about the repatriation, ongoing repatriation work that is happening, has been happening for a long time, um, and thinking specifically about Michigan um, and the tribes in Michigan doing that work. Um, mm -hmm. I remember when we, when I interviewed you um, for that first film, I'm not to say that, that it was like sort of my introduction to your relationship to that work. Um, and I really wanted to shine a light on it and focus on it more in a way because it seemed so important. Um, but it, it wasn't in the context of that film. It didn't, it didn't fit quite. Um, so it's something that we've tried, we've tried to pursue afterwards. Um, and to be honest, it's a really, um, it's a really uh, scary subject to approach with film, right? Um, just thinking about how, like I was saying, there's just like this extractive tradition of, of cinema. Um, so it's like, and not to say making a film about my community, my living community was like really nerve wracking, uh, but then making a film, you know, advocating for the ancestors is, is even more um, nerve wracking in a way. But I feel like there's a real uh, urgency to it um, from the perspective of needing to educate settlers about the fact that, you know, these institutions like museums and universities that they sometimes only see in a really positive light, right? As like places spreading information for the common good um, actually have these really deep, dark histories um, of, of exploiting uh, not only our, our objects, but, but our ancestors. Um, mm -hmm. And so I feel like that is something that, that most people outside of Indian country aren't really aware of at all. Um, and these institutions get to kind of have this really positive association, um, which allows them to not, to like avoid really dealing, dealing with this history. And, and reconciling it in, in a, a meaningful and authentic way. Um, and I've also been like really amazed to see that the work that repatriation specialists are doing um, is, is so effective um, at not only bringing the ancestors home, but really changing the way people think in these institutions in a really deep, fundamental way. Um, and I feel like, like, uh, bringing that 
to light, that dynamic to light to a broader audience is, is hopefully a way of compelling these institutions, uh, sort of shaming them in a way into complying uh, more easily um, with NAC for law um, and repatriation requests. Um, mm -hmm. Because I know it's a really long, ongoing bureaucratic process and it's like kind of about changing hearts and minds in institutions to really get it done. And I hope that the film can sort of, this next film that I'm working on about repatriation can hopefully like serve as an educational tool um, for like the next generation of archeologists and museum professionals so that they sort of can't claim that they don't know how messed up any of this stuff is or what an, an indigenous perspective on it might be. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting because, you know, third, it's been over 30 years since NAGPRA was enacted and we're still, you know, in a place where there's over 116,000 ancestors who have not been returned home to their communities. And so, you know, I think and any, any, you know, film or any sort of indigenous perspective on NAGPRA is important. Um, do you, let's, let's show, let's show that. It's uh, the violence of a civilization without secrets. Is that, is that the right title? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just to give a little background. Um, so me and my brother are working on like a feature length, a long documentary um, about repatriation. And what we're about to see is like a nine minute short film that we made um, before working on the feature. Um, it's not focused on Michigan, it's specifically focused on um, the Ancient One or the Kennewick Man, which is a, a high profile repatriation case. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess just a, like, a little, I think like a trigger warning is, is good just because the, the film can be kind of intense at points. And you know, anytime we're talking about repatriation and our ancestors being treated these ways in these institutions, it's just, it's good to remind people that it's sometimes watching yeah. that can be traumatic. I, I can appreciate that. Thank you for, for saying that. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and hit play here. I think it's about nine minutes. Awesome. One morning in 1784, Thomas Jefferson became America's first archeologist when he decided to indulge his curiosity and unearth human remains from an Indian burial mound. Since that day, archaeologists, anthropologists, amateur explorers, and hobbyists have collected and sent thousands of boxes of indigenous human remains to museums and universities, often in the hope that they would become the objects of scientific study and help prove widely held beliefs about indigenous racial inferiority, or to prove insight into an alternate history that the first people in the New World were in fact European. It was one of those things no one ever doubted. The first people on this continent were the Indians, period. No reason to believe otherwise. But two summers ago in the town of Kennewick, Washington, a skeleton turned up that could turn out to be the missing link between what we thought to be the truth and what actually is the truth. A truth, if it is the truth, that the Indians are not happy with and would just as soon leave well enough alone. The story of Kennewick Man started out like an ordinary murder mystery. Two young men made news when they found a skull on the bank of the Columbia River near Kennewick, Washington. Suspecting foul play, they called the police, who thought the skull looked very old. They were right. Anthropologists excavated the area and found the full skeleton determined it had been carefully buried along the river 9,000 years ago. One of the oldest intact skeletons ever found in North America, a scientific treasure. Prosopopeia, prosopia, prosopopeia. Now, a figure of speech in which an abstract thing is personified. Now, a figure of speech in which an imagined or absent person or thing is represented as speaking. Human remains are the kind of things from which the trace of the subject cannot be fully removed. 
their appearance and presentation in the courts of law and public opinion has in fact blurred something of the distinction between object and subject, between evidence and testimony. You could put this one in a crowd of, of Native American skulls. I mean, you could put him in with a hundred of them and you'd still pick him right out of the crowd. His skull shape falls way outside the range for modern Native Americans. But I'm asking about the central question of concern. Who was here first? Doesn't he already challenge that? He challenges it. He challenges it. He does. Misplaced guilt is too heavy a rucksack to carry about. And our ancient roots on this continent give us position as good as or better than any, one that is not a settler mentality, that we are not newcomers, that we are not interlopers, that we are not evil conquering Europeans, but that in fact we have ancient, ancient roots here that give us a right to say we too are native peoples, we too are first peoples, we too are indigenous to this soil. We have our roots here, we will not surrender, we will not be swept from this place. We will instead sink those roots, deepen those roots, not be transient, but instead truly inhabit this place. Forensics is, of course, not simply about science, but also about physical objects as they become evidence. Things submitted for interpretation in an effort to persuade. Since objects do not speak for themselves, a person or a technology must mediate between the object and the forum to present it and tell its story. In U.S. court, the remains of the Kennewick man are considered objects. Each bone and other piece of property was contested ownership. And only forensic anthropologists have the authority to speak for them, to tell their story. But for the Columbia Basin tribes, the Ancient One is an ancestor. His bones were unearthed from Indian land, so they speak for themselves. We know what happened 10,000 years ago. I know what happened 10,000 years ago at home, along the Columbia River, because my teachings from my older people tell me how life was 10,000 years ago and the scientists cannot accept the fact that just because it's not written down in a book it's not fact it's fact to me because I live it every day
entire museum's practice speaks of the terrible impulse of domination, a sort of indiscriminate domination. Nothing escapes the collector's impulse, as if our entire linear and accumulative culture collapses if we cannot stockpile the past into plain view. Memory is not a container for information, but a perpetually emergent process. pretty intense super intense <laughs> what our audience think of that drop some drop some comments and... wow that's pretty intense super intense <laughs> what our audience think of that drop some drop some comments there's, a, there's an echo from one of you wow. is that you zach Who's got it on their phone? There's an echo. I got it turned off. <laughs> <laughs> My internet Busted. was on. Busted. <laughs> Remove the echo. Hmm. Do you have it on your phone still, Zach? You have to shut that off. Okay. Sorry, I think that, that's done now. Apologies. Okay. All right. Whew, we made it out a lot. Right. Welcome to a live show, friends. <laughs> We're killing it. We're killing it. It was it was the filmmaker's fault. So no yeah. excuses. I'm sorry. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> oh no. I remember the Kennewick man because like I grew up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And so that's like I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's really close. And so I remember the Kennewick man, you know, when it happened and it was intense and controversial then. And it's so wild that even this far out from the past that it's still, you know, it's still a, a point of controversy. Totally. Yeah. One of the things that I was really shocked by and sort of the reason for making the film was um, just watching that 60 Minutes piece. Uh, which is just so incredibly racist and under-researched um, and just being shocked by that. And knowing that, you know, 60 Minutes, they often do like follow-up stories, you know? Um, and I also thought it was really telling that they didn't do any follow-up with a Kennewick man ever after sort of telling the story about how he's European, which is insane. Um, so part of making the film was like trying to, do 60 minutes as follow up for them almost a little bit to like really shine a, a light on that. And then showing um, another really important part about that was um, that, that guy who's in the circle who's talking again about sort of how Europeans were here first, um, who's like the head of like uh, an insane white supremacist organization. And just to show how, you know, Western sciences foundation is, is really, really deeply rooted and some really intense racism um, that persists to this day, even though people don't like to sort of admit it or, or think about it. Um, and that, you know, those anthropologists that were working for the Smithsonian, um, you know, made these really absurd, untrue claims under the guise of science. Um, mm -hmm. and so much so that, that white supremacists ran with it. Um, I think something else that really intrigued me about that was just how, um, 
how the courts of law in the U.S., how like our our traditions and our way of telling history uh, is like not admissible as evidence, I guess, in a way, and how how problematic that can really be, um, especially in relation to the to that story. I always think of those like you know colonial collection practices at these you know so called prestigious you know places and and these people that uphold them, and it, and it's always interesting to me how you know, the, the burden is always moved to the tribes, you know, to try to prove, we're always having to prove something, right? Prove this is our ancestor, prove that's a funerary object, prove this is that. Um, and, you know, tribes a lot of times don't have the capacity to keep doing that, um, but, but we have to in order to get movement on these things to bring our ancestors home. So I can appreciate the, you know, the story that you're telling there with, with Kennewick Man being such a well-known you know, case for repatriation. It's easy to tell the story and get people to listen, you know, through, through, through that lens. So, um, so, so let me ask you something. So, um, you're, you're, you're working on a couple of things right now, right? So, so one of those things I think you mentioned is a, is another film that will really highlight, maybe dig a little deeper into repatriation and, um, why don't we we just talk about that a little bit? Maybe it feels right to to talk more a little more about repatriation. We we like to talk about repatriation here. You know, the association has a, a large program area of repatriation, and, and we work really hard to to help the tribes in, in their pursuit of their ancestors and objects. And and we also like to hold you know non-compliant institutions accountable under the law. So so we. We know a little bit about repatriation here, so we like to talk about it. <laughs> totally, yeah, yeah. So, so that that film was like um, my first foray in, into trying to make a film about uh, repatriation related to that. Um, but you know, that film you noticed is like um, it's basically all archival material. It's all from YouTube or whatever. There, there's nothing that we we filmed ourselves, um, and so. Me and my brother are currently working on a, a feature film um, about repatriation um, with the title uh, Anikobajigan, um, which is like an Anishinaabe word that you know, translates to ancestors. It also means like great, great grandparent, great, great grandchild. So uh, it has like a, a deeper meaning too in, in that way um, of sort of like collapsing the, the past and, and the future um, in the way that we think about what, it, what an ancestor is. Um, and so the film that we're, we're currently working on um, has, you know, more of a focus on, on Michigan um, and on, and to a certain extent, like the nuts and bolts work of, of repatriation. Um, I've been really inspired by the work of, of MACPRA, um, the Michigan Anishinaabemek Cultural Preservation Repatriation Alliance, um, and have just spent a lot of time learning about that repatriation work. Um, you know, I think oftentimes people think that filmmakers are experts on the, the subjects they make films about. Um, and that's that's rarely true, you know? It's like, um, it's, I've, so the process of making the film has really been uh, trying to be humble and learn a lot about that work um, as much as possible and and try to figure out a way to, to present that work um, for to indigenous audiences, because also I feel like, you know, repatriation is really big in Indian country, but it's not something that I think like everybody in our communities is like super aware of or on board about all the time. And so much of the work behind the scenes, like a lot, a lot of work, I think that just like people don't always know about or doesn't always get seen or, or celebrated in a way. Um, so I think that that was always really important. Um, it's like uh, just showing the people who actually do that work and, and how dedicated they are to it and how meaningful it is um, and, and the impact that it has on, on our communities. Um, and like I was saying before, like the goal of that film is, is really to serve like as an educational tool to like present an indigenous perspective on repatriation also for, for non-indigenous people who will be making decisions about those sorts of things in the future as well, you know? Um, yeah, and I think, and the other sort of thread of the film is a kind of like a, a zooming out view to a certain extent. 
there's like the the day-to-day -day work that has to happen on the ground um but then also thinking about that that bigger picture of like why this work is necessary in the first place you know like how how things got to be this way in the first place and then kind of investigating a little bit more deeply um the sort of the really racist roots of, of science as sort of practiced in settler colonial societies um and just try to like um which is not to say that it, uh, the film tries to be anti-science in, in any way whatsoever too i feel like that's a, a common misconception a sort of like false dichotomy between native people and science and many people aren't anti-science in any way whatsoever uh we're amazing scientists i think you would argue in a lot of different ways um but it's more about uh, uh, ethics, I think, more than anything else, and the sort of like ethics of, of relationality and reciprocity um, that sort of differentiates maybe like a native science from a settler colonial science. Because I feel like something you hear a lot from maybe archaeologists or museum professionals that are less sympathetic uh, is that sort of like, oh, you're just anti-science. You just don't want to know the truth, and it's like. No, that's not the case at all. Uh, it's it's about like ethics and relationships and consent, um, and that's the the most important part. Um, so it does try to sort of like get at those the, the darker heart of that Western practice of science, um, but not in a way that uh, tries to demonize the whole practice or sort of reinforce that sort of false dichotomy um, mm -hmm. that. Native people are, are unscientific inherently or, or don't, don't approve of, of that. Um, well, and with the Kennewick man, it, at least what I recall from it um, was that the attitude was also like, see, we've been here. Like we are just entitled to this space as the indigenous people that lived here. And it almost added to the conquer mindset discussion that, that goes on a, the, especially I notice at least in the in the Northwest where it's like, see, uh, this proves it. <laughs> justification. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what they wanted, justification. Well, how how's it um how's it well first off, shout out to to MACFRA, the Michigan Anishinaabe Cultural Preservation and Repatriation Alliance. It's a consortium of twelve federally recognized tribes and the state historic tribes in Michigan. Um, so I, I used to be part of MacPro, and I remember when you, you and your brother Adam came to us and said, we're thinking of doing this documentary on repatriation, and we, you know, we want to work with MacPro. And I remember just like, ugh, like cringing, like, oh no. <laughs> but, but then hearing how, how you were going to do it and, and talking with the elders and getting the approval and, and of MacPro, um, I can't even imagine what it feels like to watch some of this repatriation negotiations and the consultations and you know even even the hardships and, and the emotions and the spirituality to be behind the camera kind of like a fly on the wall watching this all play out real time i mean there have been people who have tried to make repatriation documentaries and failed because there's so much of the story you can't share that that hard line of spirituality but there's so much that needs to be shared but how do you present that and and i think i haven't seen this film yet it's according to about correct me if i'm wrong it's not done yet right no. some works and so we don't even know how how it's all going to shape up but like what's it like what's the pressure like behind the camera in that kind of a situation <laughs> when you've got elders and and ancestors and all these things that are just you know so important to to, our, to us in these discussions happening. What's it feel like? It's a, a great question. Um, it's it's really powerful. And it's a uh, uh, a huge responsibility that we don't take lightly at, at all. Um, I think you know one of the things that we kind of set out to do when making this film, kind of like you're referencing, is like you know, we brought this idea, but we're like should we do this? We're like, hey, we're gonna do this. We're like, should we do this? What do you, what does everybody think? Um, and that like we, you know, attended meetings, I think for like a year or a year and a half before 
filming anything, you know, and, and really realizing that we're not the, um, the experts in any way whatsoever about this subject. And that, you know, as good as your intentions may be, um, it's, there's always, always a possibility that the, that they don't have a good outcome if you don't be really careful and like constantly in consultation with people whose life's work this is. Um, so I, that's part of it. I always feel that uh, responsibility um, to be really careful and thoughtful and ask questions multiple times before filming something um, and, and just getting into these sort of philosophical conversations um, with people who are much closer to the work about how to best serve the ancestors by creating this film. Um, and it's, it's a work in progress uh, still. Um, you know, I think another thing that was really important was, was MACPRA establishing what it was okay for us to film and what it's not okay for us to film really mm -hmm. early on in that process. Um, and I think, you know, some people could say that, you know, making a film about something that you can't show is like, that provides a challenge, certainly. But I think it also um, is like a, a reason for creativity. Uh, like sometimes restrictions have uh, like generative potential actually. Um, and like the worst thing that could possibly happen with this film is to go in with good intentions and do something harmful to the ancestors. So it's just like an abundance of caution I think is, is the main thing uh, and patience. like. As opposed to any other documentary project where, again, you're trying to extract something quickly, you're trying to film, it's like that we just really approached this project with a lot of patience um, and have been uh, really fortunate to, to also um, have people have a lot of patience with us um, working on this film, like having it take so long and taking our time and having multiple conversations. Um, and we're pretty deep into production when the pandemic happened. Um, and that kind of really put everything on a pause. Um, basically until now, um, we're I'm starting to pick up again. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, and being in those actual rooms, I mean, it's nerve wracking and humbling, but it's also just like so amazing to see that work happen. Um, and so, I don't know, also like Mac for seeing like state representatives um, and government agencies consult so closely and thoughtfully with tribes and really like seeing that power dynamic in that room um, where the tribes are the ones with the power, it really seems like, um, it's really like, that's amazing. and really like gives me hope in a, in a big way too. Um, and like that, that can seem bureaucratic, but I think it's like actually really, really important and, and powerful um, in a way too. And it's something that we really wanna show as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's humbling and it just feels like, uh, uh, just like a blessing to, to be able to be in those rooms and to have people trust us with that. Um, and the whole film is just like, that's how we're taking our time. It's like a process of, of not rushing that, you know? We're really looking forward to, to seeing that. When, when do you, when do you think you might be done with it? What, is there a, a time frame? Yeah, it's a good question. I think if um, it's a little pandemic specific, because we're kind of out of the woods, so we're not totally out of the woods yet, you know. Um, but, you know, I hope it could be as soon as uh, at least like having a rough, rougher cuts of it, um, as soon as like maybe January, uh, this upcoming oh. January. I want to do, do a lot of production um, in the coming months with the pandemic permits it, because we've been holding off for so long. Yeah. I'm, I'm losing patience. I have patience for the elders and for the ancestors, but the pandemic, not so much <laughs> after a while. But also it's like, I'm not gonna put any elder at risk to interview them for a movie. So it just mm -hmm. takes patience, you know? But yeah, maybe a year from now, totally finished, in inshallah, if we're lucky. <laughs> I like that, Ethan. And you're, I, I agree. A little, a little, 
little sense of humor can go a long way. <laughs> I think Native people, we have such a good sense of humor. We do. So true. Um, um, I guess one of my questions is what future, like once you're finished with this project, not to add any pressure to you, but what kind of future projects do you envision being able to tackle now that you've, you know, started down this path? No, that's a great question. Thanks, thanks for asking. Um, I have me and my brother have one super ambitious project that um, I hope we can make one day, um, but it'll take probably a decade, I feel like, to do it the right way. And it's just as nerve wracking, if not more, than than Anikovic again, which is saying something. Um, but uh, you know, really interested not just making documentaries, but also making narrative films too. Mm -hmm. um, and and knowing that that just like reaches a, a broader audience in a lot of ways. And um, I think you can sort of like put in a lot of knowledge and and like uh, sort of politics into a narrative film. Uh, and, it, and the narrative film is sort of the sugar that helps the medicine go down um, in a way. Um, so we're really interested in making a film about uh, Norval Morrison. Um, it's like a, a pretty famous Anishinaabe uh, artist, um, painter, um, sort of started like the Woodland School style that, that is pretty iconic now. Um, and, you know, me and Adam, me and my brother Adam, we also um, make films and also kind of work in like a contemporary art world as well, um, doing like video installations and sound installations. Um, and so Norval Morso is always super uh, inspiring for us. And also some of Norval Morso's work is featured in A Not To Say, and his whole practice was really uh, the basis of, of A Not To Say in some ways, where he was taking um, these traditional stories um, and, and telling them in a new medium, um, which for him was like contemporary art and painting, um, and which was something at the time and still is like really controversial, right? Even when Norval Morceau was doing that, there was a lot of Ojibwe people who really didn't think he should be doing that. Um, and, and they may have definitely had a, a point too, for sure. Uh, but I think it's also undeniable um, the impact that Norval Morceau's art has had on indigenous people in the Americas. Uh, and in the sense that there's like a whole generations of artists who have sort of created life livelihoods after, based upon sort of the the trail that he blazed, um, and also mm -hmm. just like raising awareness of Anishinaabe people and Anishinaabe artistry throughout the Americas. Um, and his life was really, uh, he led a really intense, amazing, uh, complicated, problematic, uh, fascinating life. Um, and there's a, a, a biography about him um, written by uh, an Ojibwe poet and author um, Armand Garnett Rufo, uh, called Man Changing into Thunderbird. Um, I think there's a few different biographies, but that's uh, a more recent one that is very, it reads like a novel almost, um, and it covers his whole life, but in this really poetic way that only could have been written by another Ojibwe person, I think, in a way. Um, and so, like, my, our 10 year plan is to like make a film based upon parts of that novel. Um, and yeah, that'll be a, a long, scary process, but I think also like it's a story that needs to be told and, and that relates to so many other things in Indian country that can like sort of reach a broader audience as well. Uh, there's that documentary about him called There Are No Fakes, um, which is where I learned more about his art and his history. And it left me feeling so much like I want more of the story. So I can understand how you can revisit that topic and have plenty of stuff um, to, to learn about because you're right. There was, there's so much to his complex life and the things that have happened to him. And I, I do wonder that like sometimes I'll see different things happening in, in, in my community as well. And I'm like, is that another situation like this? <laughs> so it's, I think that it, I think that as the internet becomes more prolific than what it even is now, that there is probably plenty of information too, that needs to be had about artists educating themselves on how to protect themselves and how to ensure that 
these predators that still exist today that take advantage of people um, are either stopped or other community members are looking out for them to make sure this doesn't happen again. So. Totally. Yeah. yeah that's Why so I didn't know that. <laughs> I, know like, hey, I know that. I know <laughs> <laughs> totally. I really uh, heavily recommend the the biography too. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will. Yeah. It's a fun. I mean, it's it's intense, but it's uh, mm -hmm. it's really readable and fun. Like it reads mm -hmm. like a novel. Um, it like lends itself to that sort of treatment. Um, and mm -hmm. it, yeah, it goes through his whole life. And there's a hundred movies in there, I think. So. <laughs> I got goosebumps when you said that was kind of. Um, your your you and Adam's kind of goal over the next decade. I I don't know that I I would you know like that anyone else could tell the story the way that you guys can only because you're almost paving this way for Anishinaabe filmmaking. Like I I love I love what you're doing because there might be other indigenous filmmakers out there, but like, you know, I really feel like you guys are doing this in a way that's really inherently Anishinaabe. This is so cool. Like this is, these are the the ways that our stories are gonna perpetuate themselves into the future. It's just a, a really beautiful thing to see and to see you guys kind of really stepping into that. It's just incredible as someone who, you know, has, has watched you grow over 20 some years. <laughs> Um, well, I know we're, we might be getting to the end here, but do you want to talk about um, the New Red Order? That's yeah. kind of the current project you're doing, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's a few things happening at the same time. Um, but yeah, New Red Order is one of them. Um, and that's uh, a project um, that we work on with a few different people. It's not only me and Adam. Uh, this other artist, Jackson Paulus, who's the client uh, from Alaska, is also a part of the group. And there's, it's really like a rotating and expanding group of people. Um, and New Red Order is sort of the moniker that we use, um, not for film stuff, but for like uh, art, art stuff, like uh, video installations for the most part. Um, and the idea kind of came from a few different places. Um, but it's really like through the process of, of getting and not to say the film out into the world. Um, you know, it was so amazing to show the film in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, but I definitely had harder experiences showing it to non-Indigenous audiences, um, you know, where I would get a good reception, but in some ways like not feel good about that. <laughs> um, where like people would say maybe that like, oh, they had learned so much and, and thanks. Um, but I worry sometimes with documentary films that like people watch a movie and they learn about something and they feel like they've done something just by virtue of having learned about it, right? But yeah. like, actually they haven't even taken the first step or they barely taken the first step. <laughs> Yeah, it was like um, when everything was happening last summer with the Black Lives Matter movement and social justice and people were kept posting all the books. And it was like, you can read all the books you want, but if you don't take any action, there's you're not actually doing anything. And if you're not addressing people's things, it, and it falls into the same things. I watch a lot of documentaries and I know there's plenty of stuff that I've watched a documentary on. And it was like, oh, that was neat. And, you know, so I fall into that too. Where it's like, oh, that was neat to learn about. But then there's no like next steps to that, so. Totally. Yeah, it's a problem because I feel like the way that, it's not the way we're conditioned to think about that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like we yeah. should feel good about having watched it. Not that there's anything wrong with that either, but it's like this next steps have to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that was part of, part of how I just had a kind of an icky feeling in my stomach about like sharing this information with my community. Um, and like, it's good that, that people can, you know, have a more critical, complex, nuanced view of native people. Um, but it's like barely the first step. And, and I just felt like people, white people may have been congratulating themselves a little bit too much, you know? Um, and we're just thinking about the ways that like as a native filmmaker or a native artist invited into these sort of non-indigenous spaces and like, museums and universities that in some ways are kind of like being asked to be like informants um kind of like in the in the police sense or like the traditional like anthropological sense where like we're supposed to 
share information about our communities to non-Indigenous audiences, um, but in a way that never actually is reciprocal, you know, that, that like, okay, we're giving yeah. you information about our community, but what does our community get from that? Um, and I was thinking about the ways that like, there also is this real desire in America and even, you know, from the founding of it, um, but even more so now, I think, for like native culture, native philosophy, like, like indigeneity, like just the very like feeling of being from here. Um, there is a lot of, a lot of non-indigenous people really de desire that, I think, in different ways, consciously and subconsciously. Um, mm -hmm. And like that desire like definitely has, can have like really negative effects sometimes when it becomes this like extractive thing that is shallow and not reciprocal. Um, but that desire also seems to kind of be unavoidable, right? It's like since the Boston Tea Party, when they dressed up as Indians, America has, has been wanting to play play Indian and be Indian to a certain extent. Um, so, but since like that desire doesn't seem to be ending or going anywhere, like I totally understand the reaction to that desire just being like shutting it down, um, which is totally legit. And I think oftentimes the right thing to do. Um, but it also made me think that like, you know, what does that mean for the future uh, between like indigenous people and non-indigenous people? Um, and when non-indigenous people like showcase interest in, in native art, culture, philosophy. Um, language. Language, totally. Mm -hmm. That's so, so important. Um, just thinking that, that, that maybe shutting that desire down isn't the only way to accomplish something for native people. That, that sometimes mm -hmm. there might be a way of like, shaping that desire or rechanneling it um, to actually benefit native people, you know, in a reciprocal way. Um, and that kind of became like the foundation of, of New Red Order in some ways was kind of like, I kind of think of New Red Order as like, no, it's not like an art group. It's like, we call it a, a public secret society. Um, it's like, a, or it could be like a political party or a think tank, or like maybe even a cult, it's kind of unclear, but it's like a place where I think non-indigenous people who have an interest in indigeneity um, can hopefully like engage with that in a way that is actually reciprocal, where they actually end up giving something back. Um, and so like a lot of the, the videos and installations that we do is sort of about uh, sort of confronting that dynamic head on, that that when people go into an art museum to see native art, that they have a certain expectation about what they're gonna see and what they're gonna get out of it. Um, and that expectation usually doesn't, doesn't include them actually doing anything to support native people in any way. And so a lot of the New Red Order's work is really just like sort of trying to educate people, non-indigenous people, um, but also like trying to instrumentalize them and and be like, no, you have to do something. <laughs> like you have to do concrete actions that actually benefit indigenous people um, and that you can't just sort of passively support. Like in, a, in an ongoing settler colonial state, you're either perpetuating settler colonialism and, and uh, the removal of, of us from our land, or you're actually doing something about it. There's sort of no neutral ground to stand on in a way. Um, and so a lot of what we try to do is like really, really get that idea across um, to like, to all audiences. But it's also like a really, um, it's a project in its really early stages. And I think we don't want to control it uh, entirely ourselves. Um, and we want it to grow beyond uh, us and, into a way where like it really can um, be a force in the world uh, that isn't something that's just about art, you know, um, or just about representation, but is also maybe like uh, a way of creating relationships that can, can last into the future and really change some of the dynamics um, between native people and non-native people. And like some of the things we advocate for are like, like land repatriation um, like the land back movement, of course. Um, you know, I think we've seen like land acknowledgements start to be practiced in the States a lot recently. 
Um, and, you know, I think that's been like a, a kind of a, a blessing and a curse in some ways. Um, you know, I feel like they kind of migrated from Canada on down. Um, I feel like in, in Canada, you should hear a lot of critical thinking about land acknowledgements because they've been practiced there for so long that they become kind of um, like rote or like perfunctory or like uh, something that someone says to get out of the way at the beginning of an event, like listing the sponsors or something. Like checking a box. Exactly. And that it's actually kind of dangerous in a way because it kind of serves to alleviate guilt, kind of like watching a documentary can, where you're like, oh, I said, I said the thing, so I did something about it. But it's like, no, you just occupied that you're, uh, you acknowledge that you're, occup that you're occupying indigenous land and you're just continuing to do it after saying that and not do anything for native people. Um, so one of the things that we thought is that like as land acknowledgements sort of translate to this new national context in the US, like how can we reimagine what that practice is uh, and how can it actually be something that's reciprocal and like actually benefits indigenous people. So we've been trying to like work with institutions who want to adopt a land acknowledgement um, and, and really communicate to them that if you want to do that, that acknowledgement has to be, has to come along with like a list of concrete actions that you're going to take to actually benefit indigenous people, like kind of put your money where your mouth is sort of thing. Um, and we've had like some traction with that slowly uh, but surely, um, starting in, with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit. Um, and it, it definitely is like an uphill battle. And I think also sometimes two land acknowledgements seem like, although they are really important, sometimes they seem like so far removed from the actual problems in our communities too. But like mm -hmm. we're just trying to think about ways that we can make them actually address those problems or provide resources for people, um, as opposed to just this sort of lip service. It's sort of what, changed that dynamic. What kind of steps did you do you did you recommend in that situation out of curiosity? Um, because I often hear them and I see them at conferences and I'm like and, and I do ask myself like what is the point of doing this if it's just making a statement, if there's not a call to action kind of tacked on to the back end of it. So how are you practicing that with the with the museum? Yeah. It's been a long process and we're still, I think, all working it out together. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the first thing was sort of like uh, helping them with their language and making sure that built into the language was this sort of commitment to action um, and that being the first step. And then having them uh, say that, that they will share the list of actions that they're gonna do as part of the land acknowledgement mm -hmm. as like something for them to live up to. It's like, okay, if you're gonna say this, you kind of have to do it now. Um, and so, and we're currently in the process of, of working out what those actions are going to be. Um, we sort of facilitated the creation of uh, the call it the Wawayatanang um, Arts Council. It's like the name of Detroit, um, which is like, so different community members from Detroit that are interested in and thinking about what a land acknowledgement can be and how a museum can benefit the community there. Um, we've been like meeting regularly to discuss what these actions are and basically get the museum to adopt them. Um, and we made a lot of progress so far and I think it'll, they're practicing the acknowledgement, they made the commitment and we're sort of like working with them on, on the concrete actions now. Um, but I think it's something that goes to show that like landing acknowledgement, it's not a one-off thing. It's not like you can write something and you're done. It's like, I think people should rewrite it, to be honest, and like make it more personal maybe. Um, and then also that it's actually about being in dialogue and in a reciprocal relationship with indigenous people whose land you're occupying. And so it's like creating this ongoing relationship and chain of communication between the community and the museum there. Um, so, and yeah. We, just also to say that like, that work is like uh, something that we've tried to push forward, but that there's so many people who are really carrying it forward. Um, that it's just like a kernel of an idea that people have really run with and made their own. And that I think hopefully can serve maybe as a model in the future um, for other museums or organizations. Because when you tell them, okay, you have to, it can't just be lip service. 
I think institutions get scared because they they don't want to take actions usually, and they don't know what those are, and and people are scared to give up power. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to initiate those conversations and sort of say like, okay, if you want your land acknowledgement, you have to work for it, and you have to like be in relation, and you have to be in dialogue. You actually have to yeah. do something. Yeah, I can see like. Like as you were talking, Zach, I was thinking like, what is like a real tangible thing that a museum could do for the native community? Like, and, and what I'm thinking in my mind is like, you're talking about institutions who probably have hundreds of people a day, thousands of people a year coming through those doors. Like I could see something like, like offering, you know, free space for local indigenous artists or something as a way to like really support the, the local native population and, you know, really doing some like, like really cool events where there's real natives, you know, presenting real contemporary art and not necessarily, um, you know, things that are always from the past, but more contemporary art or something. It's really just a beautiful concept. I love this. Um, and, and also wondering like, so if, if the new, the new red order isn't, it's more of like a abstract concept is what I'm gathering. Like who, who can be part of this, like, secret but not secret thing <laughs> public secret society yeah like can i be in it because i want to be. <laughs> yeah, definitely if everybody can i actually um and we would love to have you in it actually yeah part of it is that um we're actively recruiting uh and you know i describe it abstractly to try not to limit what it can be but it is really concrete. It is a bunch of people that, that meet and talk and, and do work together. Um, okay. But if you're interested in joining, if anybody listening is interested in joining, native or non-native, um, everybody's welcome. Uh, we have a website at newredorder.org. Uh, newredorder.org. And there's a, a sort of like sign up form that you can navigate through. <coughs> I'm going to drop the link in the chat for everyone. That sounds awesome. And yeah, I think, I don't know, I think in relation to New Red Order specifically, and kind of, but definitely everything I've been saying, um, all this stuff is like a work in progress um, and needs to get better and more thoughtful and, and more work through. And like, we need to talk more in community about it and help that help shape it. So I just want to say that like, I'm really interested and open to, to feedback and you know if, if anyone's interested in ever talking or yeah I want I want it to grow together and it's all uh, in progress is this it <laughs> oh yeah that's the one <laughs> <laughs> This is so good. She moved, Colleen. It's not so secret, but secret. Hmm. Public secret. <laughs> so this is the this is the website. And you can you can sign up to be to be involved. Way cool. Yeah, part of part of that uh, the pitch in the website and why we're recruiting people too and also like yeah, recruiting non-Indigenous people too is like thinking about how, you know, we as Native people have to act as informants sort of on our own communities um, in these sort of spaces. And part of what we want with the New Red Order is like non-Native people to inform on their own cultures and community and really like share information about uh, their actual sort of approaches and thoughts about Indigeneity and Native people as a way of, of learning more about how to, how to rechannel that desire into something that actually benefits Native people. Um, I love this. <laughs> so cool. Uh, in the future too, just, I guess last question, but uh, do you think in the future too, that as you create more films that you'll start to integrate those practices into your filmmaking too, where you're kind of adding that next steps call to action for people so that they aren't just engaging in this as like a checking the box type of content, but that they know what they should do next, like best recommendations? 
Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a huge part. And like, yeah, that's a, it's a great point. Cause like a say had that thread and then new red order tries to address it in some ways. And mm-hmm. I feel like they can meet in the film world mm-hmm. in a way too. And I think a big part of it is just like, yeah, integrating that into like the politics of a film and the philosophy of a film and like how it communicates to an audience. Um, and then, yeah, getting really specific about, about calls to action and mm-hmm. like kind of breaking that fourth wall in terms of like the, the direct sort of ask or um, implicating the viewer in a way that can't be avoided, you know, that it's not just a, a passive experience of, mm-hmm. of watching something uh, that I happened think a long time ago. Bit. That's part of the hard part of all of this stuff that we're talking about, too, is it's like so many of these issues have been happening for so long. I mean, the association itself has been in place for 100 years. And, you know, so when you start looking at that history, you start feeling like, well, where do I even begin? Even even as a native, you know, you you look at it and you go, where do I even start? Like, what's my responsibility? How mad do I need to be to take action? And what are my next steps and things like that. So, I mean, we've had those conversations in our family over the years a lot. And so, you know, sometimes I think we do have to provide a little bit of guidance when we're either creating content or, um, or, you know, embarking on some of these projects like that and tell people here, here's the next step we need you to take this, you know? And so it's a, but it's an awkward it's so counterintuitive too to native culture to be like, <laughs> here's what's here's what you have to do now. <laughs> That's true, but some people really need to be told too. I think. Uh, it's mm. one, one last thing for like the sort of call to action for New Red Order now, um, and our most recent installation uh, is the call to action is, is give it back. Um, it's like land repatriation, basically. Um, so part of the installation is like a, a mock real estate office um, where like you have the listings in the windows, um, but the listings are actually all of actual examples of voluntary land repatriation where settlers have given land back to native tribes or individuals. Um, and you know the idea is to show people, I think there's like 36 examples in the exhibit that like this isn't something that's impossible, you know, that we, were, uh, that we were dispossessed of our land over a period of 500 years and it may take 500 years to get it back slowly piece by piece, uh, but that it's not impossible. It's only impossible if that's your attitude about it um, and to sort of like show those examples. So our current call to action is give it back. I love that. We, we, we talk a lot about, about that here at the association about, you know, ancestors back, land back, children back, ceremony back, you know, all the things that make us who we are. We want all of those things back. So um, th- this is really uh, great to, to hear. Um, and, and one thing I, I kind of wanted to just reiterate for our audience and for those listening who, who might be saying to themselves, you know, um, I'm doing these land acknowledgements and, and I'm doing this in a good way. And I, and I want to say to them, you know, we, we definitely don't want to discourage anyone from doing that um, because for so long, the dial didn't even move at all. And, and so we are thankful to be acknowledged and, and to have our lands be acknowledged. And, and what we're really talking about here is just taking that a couple of steps further, right. And putting more action into that and really, um, you know, it's saying, and, and really speaking that into fruition of like how we're gonna impact, you know, native communities and what we can do to, to help. So I just wanted to, to say that we don't wanna discourage anyone from that. We, we just wanna challenge them to take it a step farther. Thanks so much for that, Colleen. That's so, so true. This is why I like hanging out with Colleen is that she's always thoughtful with the follow-up. You know this, Beth. There's times we're in meetings and I'm just like, yep, good. Let's let's close it out. And Colleen always is good about stopping to make sure that we like properly close out the conversation and wrap things up. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, likewise, I love being in meetings with Jamie. We've been ho- we've been holding it down for a whole week uh, on our own without supervision. <laughs> 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 just kidding Shannon if you're watching <laughs> um, well it's been such a, a pleasure to have you here it really makes my heart feel good to to see someone I know and love doing such incredible work and, and I know that what you do is so meaningful to so many communities across Indian country so 
we really, um, you know, want to thank you for giving us some of your time tonight and sharing sharing some of your good work. And we really wish you only the best as you start to develop your latest documentary and keep working towards, you know, the new Red Order, which I'm going to sign up for after this. <laughs> Uh, wish. Thank you so, so much, Colleen. It's such a, an honor and a pleasure to be in a conversation with you both. And thank you all for the work that, that you do. It's so much more important and real and concrete. And I'm just in awe and admiration. Jimmy Glitch. Well, we likewise, the feeling is mutual. So we look forward to seeing some more of your work in the future. And um, yeah, well, you, you take care. We'll. We'll let you go, and Jamie and I will close up here. And yeah, miigwech for everything tonight. Mama P, Zach. Mama P, thanks everybody for tuning in. Super appreciate it. Mama P. Who? So, um, we need to tell everyone: please subscribe to our YouTube page. Um, it really helps us out. Check us out on YouTube. Check out all of our social media. Um, we really thank you for all of the support here at the association and for tuning in. What else do we got going on, Jamie? Um, uh, our, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, we're, we're back next week hosting Red Hoop Talk again while Shannon is on vacation. So uh, we're still getting our... our I'm trying to convince someone to come on the show for us. And so it may be us with a guest. It may just be the two of us, but we hope you guys will um, come back next week and watch again. So, And hopefully we'll have some of our, our um, technical uh, kinks worked out by then. And um, also just a reminder, our seventh annual repatriation conference is November 3rd, 10th and 17th. We expect to open registration uh, in August, so just coming up in a couple of weeks. We hope to have that open, so please check us out at the Repatriation Conference and check our website for updates and go and like and subscribe to our YouTube page. And um, anything else? Anything else we got going on? I feel like we covered a lot. Yeah. Today. So, you know. So good. Let, feeling good about let, 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 let us let everyone go now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, take good care, and we'll see you next week. Bye, my pee. Talk shocky.